we are about to get started. First, before we go any further, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to what we are going to be watching in the chat, just in case we experience uh, any technical difficulties. This way, everyone will be able to get to the film this evening and watch it at your own convenience, whether that is tonight or later this week after the live panel. And all right, so let's go ahead and get started. We're really excited to be here with everyone in the room today um, to celebrate International Open Access Week uh, with this virtual screening of the internet's own boy. And this will be the second year in a row that we've had this event and we hope that we'll continue with it. Um, first, to kick things off, we're gonna have a short panel discussion from uh, three faculty members at UGA School of Law. Um, and then we are, we're gonna record this panel again so that if people come in late or they wanna revisit this later, I know there were some individuals who RSVP'd for this and we're encouraging people to um, review the panel later this week, continue the discussion, watch the movie on your own time. And if you're here and there's other people that you know that you wish were here, feel free to share the panel with them. Anyone who RSVP'd or is attending this now will receive a follow-up email after this event is over. Um, you should get that email tomorrow and it will give you not only a link to the film to watch on your own, but also a link to the recorded panel discussion. Um, and we ask that anyone in attendance right now, if you could turn off your video, unless you are the panel, one of the panelists, and this will keep the attention on the panelists while we're having this intro discussion. Um, so our panelists today, we have Thomas Kadri. Kadri is an assistant professor at UGA Law and also holds appointments with the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication, as well as a, another recent appointment with the Women's Studies Institute at the University of Georgia. In addition to teaching torts this semester, uh, maybe we have some of his students in the room, his research and other courses focus on cybercrime, privacy, and how the law regulates technology. Um, next up, we have Jean Mangan. She is a professor at, um, she's one of our legal writing instructors and was formerly one of the staff attorneys at our School of Law's Wilbanks Cease Clinic. Mangan also teaches um, advanced writing seminar in addition to legal writing and criminal drafting and has recently published a CC licensed OER work housed in our school's own institutional repository. And um, last but definitely not least, since he is responsible for uh, spearheading our first viewing of this film last year, uh, we have Stephen Wolfson. Professor Wolfson is a research and copyright services librarian at UGA Law Library. In addition to serving as our library's contact for issues related to copyright, scholarly communication, and research related information policies, he also teaches legal research and courses exploring the intersection of law and technology in the information age. We're so excited to have all three of you here with us today. Um, I'm just gonna ask a few questions and anyone in the room, feel free to put other questions in the chat as we go through this, um, not only during the panel, but also during your viewing of the film. So Stephen, first, I wanna start with you. It was your idea to show this film in person last fall in classroom L can you share how you were introduced to this film's central figure, Aaron Schwartz, and why you selected it? And um, to a greater extent, maybe your thoughts on the privatization of knowledge that the film raises awareness of. There's a lot of questions there. I'll start with uh, where I first heard of Aaron Schwartz. Uh, I think I first heard of him when he was arrested, actually, in, I think, 2011, uh, which is part of the subject of this film that we'll We'll get into. I won't reveal what happens, but I think that's where I first heard of him. Um, I was in library school at the time, and so talking about JSTOR, which is what he was downloading a bunch of articles from, uh, and uh, open access and things like this were sort of front, front and center of my mind. So I think that's where I first heard, uh, heard about him and started following the story a little bit. Um, he was then um, uh, as well with his connections with Reddit, but also just as a, um, advocate for open access, he was, um, sort of a, a big figure, uh, in the movement against a couple pieces of legislation, uh, SOPA and PIPA, the Stop 
Online Privacy Act and the Protect Intellectual Property Act back in 2012, um, which you may remember because the internet briefly shut down uh, in protest of these pieces of legislation. And he was, um, like I said, a large figure in that. And so uh, I paid attention, I started paying attention to him back then. Uh, and then uh, again, I won't reveal his story, um, but I sort of continued to follow that. And then as far as this documentary goes, um, well, it's interesting for a few reasons. One, his story is very interesting, uh, as I hope you'll find. Um, but um, uh, also, this um, the documentary itself is uh, is uh, open licensed, and so we're able to show it without having to obtain rights in any other way. We could talk a little bit about um, sort of the benefits of open licensing and open access in general. Um, but we thought it was you know important to sort of demonstrate the um, uh, the value of open licensing and open access by actually showing you that we're able to do this because it's open licensed. Um, and then where I first heard about the documentary, um, I think it premiered at South by Southwest while I was living in Austin. Uh, so I think I first heard about it just because of where I was living. Um, but it's a really great documentary and it's absolutely worth um, all of your time. So I'm glad you're here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, that background. Uh, Thomas. Thank you for joining us too. It was actually during your interview to uh, UGA's campus last fall that I believe you saw that we were showing this film. And I remember you commented um, on sort of the serendipitous nature of that. And so we're really glad that you've joined us as a faculty member since then. Um, I recall you noting that you had shown it to other classes that you had taught. So obviously you, you too see the value of this film and what it has to offer as a part of legal education. And so um, can you share with us why you like screening this film and what lessons you feel it can teach law students and maybe other students and other disciplines uh, about the US legal system? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I remember that, that moment fondly uh, meeting you and, and Stephen and the other wonderful law librarians and, and talking about open access. and. Yeah, I, I had just presented my uh, my scholarship to the faculty, uh, and a big part of the paper that I had presented was all about uh, the main law that is kind of raised by this documentary, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, and so it really, you know, it's it's kind of really bound up in my story about how I ended up at UGA is this um, this this law and this case. Um, and it actually even dates back further than that for me. I summered at the law firm uh, that represented uh, Aaron Schwartz um, uh, in some of his legal battles. In fact, one of the partners who I worked with, uh, you'll see him in the documentary, Elliot Peters. Um, and I went to a screening with Elliot uh, in the Bay Area right when this documentary first came out. And so I had this like long entangled history with this, uh, with this case and with this issue. Um, and so, yeah, it's awesome to, to, to be here. And my, for, for any students who are thinking about taking my cybercrime class in the spring, um, if you're already you know, here now and you're gonna watch the documentary, you, you're about to complete one of the first assignments because I will assign this, uh, this, this documentary again as, as required viewing. Um, because yeah, it, it's one of the reasons I love it is that um, I think it really does push students to think about like the complicated trade-offs involved in regulation of information, right? I think uh, the documentary clearly presents uh, a kind of angle that they want to, to, to push on, on what they think the correct balance should be. Um, but I've had students come away from watching the documentary and not accept that uh, as the, you know, as the way that they think the law should, should work, right? And so um, it pushes students to think critically about the balance that they think should be struck by the law and to just acknowledge that this is up for debate. It's, it's contentious and rightly so, right? Our, our rules surrounding informational access are deeply political. Um, the, the rules governing, you know, how we can use information uh, and what restrictions there are on it are, you know, firmly tied up in the type of political society that we have and that we want to have. Um, it's not just about whether you can, you know, download music from Napster, that's a reference that's going to date me, um, probably, but you know, it's not just about that, it's about our, our access to shared knowledge, right? That's what Aaron Schwartz was, was all about. And so, 
um, I love it for, for that reason. It, it really kind of complexifies these, these issues. So I, I have my students watch that as one of the first things that they do in the class, because I think it tees up a lot of the rest of the discussion that we have throughout the semester. Thank you so much. It's, it's, a, it's great to hear a little more background as to your ties to this. Um, now I wanna move over to Jean. Uh, I know in addition to your work as an attorney and legal writing instructor that you recently published a Creative Commons licensed book through the Affordable Education Resources Grant Program. And I think you and Stephen actually worked together on some of the licensing um, about that work. So can you share with us uh, from a firsthand perspective why you elected to publish an open educational resource and maybe talk about what your experiences were with that process. Sure, so I come at this subject from a really different place than either Stephen or Thomas. I just wanted to find a way to make materials cheaper for my students was really where I started from. And I went and talked to Stephen about different ways I could provide chapters of books to my students and under copyright still blows my mind. Like I'll get it one day, but today is not that day. And no matter how many times Steven's tried to explain it to me, I still struggle. So um, anyway, I told him that and he was like, well, you know, you could just write your own. And I thought, I, I could, I teach legal writing. I could in fact write things down. And from that, really this idea was born. Um, I found out about the grant through the provost office and that was certainly helpful as an incentive. Um, but to me, there comes this question of knowledge and, and why do we want people to have it and what does it help us do? And I feel like when I came to law school, I was really privileged to come from a family with lawyers and I could go to the bookstore and I could buy all new textbooks. And that was fine. That was that was something that my parents and I had planned for. Um, but you know, on, in law school, not all students arrive on equal footing. Um, they reach law school coming from different backgrounds and with various socioeconomic, racial, and cultural hurdles that we need to overcome. And um, I just think in a time when we should be encouraging greater access to legal education from many different perspectives, one of the ways to do that is to provide no cost materials so that students don't have that, my, they don't have that barrier. Like every small barrier that I can remove, I think helps all students get one step closer and we need more diversity of views and perspectives in the law. And if this is my one small way with my one straw that I add that eventually will break the camel's back to make it so more people and more kinds of people who think in different kinds of ways come to the law school, then it's worth it to me. Off my soapbox, um, the writing it was, terrifying and intimidating and also so so good to prepare me to teach this class again i had to really think about everything that i was teaching why do i do it that way where does it come from what is my reason for it and um i i'm glad i did it i'm looking to revise it into a second edition i'm applying for an affordable learning georgia grant it's a georgia statewide grant and um everyone should think about doing it the end <laughs> This raises a really great question that I wanted to open to all three of you now that I've I've been able to get sort of a, a brief introduction of each of your perspectives and sort of your, your um, stance as it relates to this documentary. So a broader question, um, would, would any of you like to comment on the uh, value, sort of the greater value that you just touched on, Jean, of open access materials. And that could be open education resources. It could be related to um, uh, licensing. It could be related to publishing your own articles. I'll start with something that Jean just mentioned that I think gets sometimes lost in the conversation about open access, particularly in the academic space. A lot of times when, uh, in academia, when we're talking about like reasons why we want, for instance, journal articles to be cheap or easier to get a hold of is because it benefits us financially, that it's really expensive for like libraries and schools to pay for these sorts of um, uh, subscriptions. And so we're not able to provide the resources that we would want to otherwise provide. And sure, that's all great um, and true, but I think it um, uh, we lose in that sort of conversation 
the sort of more um, the more egalitarian reasons for open access, which is sort of what Jean was mentioning. That um, uh, we for, it's easy to forget in our position in as students or faculty um, in higher education that not everybody has access to any of these things. In fact, most people don't. In fact, ninety nine point nine percent of people don't have access to any of this uh, research data, these scholarly articles, um, or any of this stuff um, that we have access to that we have special access to because of our um, uh, because of our position and open access uh, hopes to the or the ideals of open access hopes to democratize access to information because we're all sort of better if we can have access this sort of access to everything and again I think that sometimes gets lost in the conversation when we talk just about like the dollars and cents that change hands right in one hand side we have these major publishers who universities feel like are hurting because we can't afford to pay their bills and I'm sure that they feel like we are just abusing them and taking their stuff, right? But that again is losing, um, I think the more important story here, which is that um, you know, the world can be a better place with more open access to information potentially. And I just wanna kind of go off that, um, is keeping in mind, like Jim was saying, it's more than just dollars and cents is that if our goal is to help people learn, then we should make that as, we should give as many resources as possible that we can, because I mean, we're in a time right now where there's just so much information that comes out all the time, but if we could all have access, equal access to make our own decisions, to think critically through what we're doing and to decide how do I want to take this data? What do I want to do with it? Then now it's more equitable, but it's also encouraging people to really research and decide for themselves rather than listening to a soundbite and going with that and instead saying, okay, I know how to go look at this stuff and make a decision on my own. And I think that's powerful. Yeah, I mean, uh, you both just hit on all of the points that I would have made. I guess the only additional thing that I would add is that um, I think it's important to recognize the values of open access within the kind of global community, not just within the United States. I think some of what we've been saying implicitly at least has been, you know, with, with a view to the student body at UGA, uh, kind of within nationally within the United States, like how this can, uh, you know, create equitable uh, futures for us to have greater access. And, and all of that is true and very important, but it's also a global story, right? There is huge uh, informational inequality uh, the digital divide between the global north and the global south is a hugely problematic feature right now in the digital age. And so to the extent that we can democratize it, not only you know, nationally within the United States, but internationally, um, we need to recognize, I think, our privilege in the United States, right? Um, that, that there are you know, so many of the leaders in terms of uh, educational and informational output uh, uh, through, you know, publishers and universities and research houses here in the United States, right, could really be benefiting uh, people all around the world. Uh, and for me, open access, it's, it's, a, it's as much a story about, you know, global access as it is about here within the United States. Thank you, each of you, for um, those replies to that question. Um, I want to allow plenty of time for people to watch the film this evening. So I'm going to ask one more question, again, open to all three of you to comment on and um, try to do so without giving away any spoilers for people who may not have seen the film before and this will be their first viewing of it. I um, have read and know through my own viewings of the film that Schwartz was targeted not only because of his bold acts of making these scholarly articles available, which is sort of at the root of the case that this film will touch on, uh, but also, and some would argue maybe more so because of his social justice platform and sort of the digital and information activism that this gave rise to and that I feel like is a, another very hot topic this year. Um, can the three of you comment on your feelings surrounding how technology in general uh, continues to transform how we perceive and value information? And this could be negatives or positives. Uh, I'll, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, uh, yeah, I think the activism story here is, is fascinating. Um, uh, and again, I don't think this will be a spoiler, but it's something for, for folks to watch out for in the film. Notice the allies that 
Schwartz has in his fight against SOPA um, and, and these other laws, right? Uh, now they are public enemy number one, right? It's like big tech companies, right? This was a, a, a very different time in the activist, online activism space in some part because we had certain larger technology companies that were standing up for a freer and open internet Right, and they weren't as um, uh, publicly vilified as they are now. And I just think that's a really interesting uh, point about the way in which, like, this space, right, this uh, uh, the, the kind of vehicles through which we can engage in online activism and the protagonists in, in that story uh, is 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 quite fluid. Right, nowadays um, uh, we sort of see the larger technology companies as, in some ways, thwarting. Uh, access to information at times. This is something that I've written about a decent amount in my scholarship um, and, and will sort of teach about as well, right? But, uh, but there are many different players involved in this story, right? And they're constantly changing. Um, and the main thing, I guess, that I would, I, I would say in terms of the broader messages to take away from this is like, none of these legal entitlements are set in stone. They're all up for debate, right? And that's, for me, is one of the um, one of the powerful things that we can take away from, from Aaron Swartz, right, is that um, uh, even if you don't necessarily agree with, you know, every point that he would want to enshrine in law, um, at the very least, he's urging us to think critically about the um, uh, sort of how legal rights and entitlements are dispersed in society. Uh, none of this is a given, right? We're, the, the failure of law to act can be as influential as law acting, right? Or as acting through law. And so that for me is one of the most interesting uh, points to take away from a, from a documentary like this. Stephen and Jean, would you like to, Stephen, go ahead. Sure, so right, I, I'm just gonna sort of echo what Thomas just said. Right in the beginning of the documentary, you'll see Aaron Swartz talking about how he sort of developed into the um, activist that he became later in his life. And I guess he was sort of an activist from the time when he was a child, but, um, you know, he, um, uh, he has this, you know, sort of question everything mentality um, that, uh, th that I personally find sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, re really sort of admirable, even though it um, led him to be at times maybe um, uh, sort of abrasive. Um, but uh, but still, I you know, it's a it's something that um, but I think is great. Uh, and and uh, Thomas started again started talking about this. Or I I want to echo that um, this you know one of the things that we could take away the from the documentary is this idea that. Um, uh, that we should be questioning these things, whether, you know, uh, whether the track we're going down is correct or not. Um, and then we can try to change it. Right. So I am the sort of person I should admit that I very fre frequently feel like I'm not in control of things, right. That life is sort of controls me and I float along with it, but he very much took a, um, opposite approach, which he believed deeply that he could affect change through his actions. Um, and again, I find that something admirable and really, uh, it's something I take away from this documentary as um, uh, uh, something I want to do better in my own life. Uh, and let me just say as well, as far as whether technology is good or bad, uh, it's a real tough call, right? I mean, it's certainly a double-edged sword. Uh, I tend to preach the negatives of tech all the time. Uh, don't follow me on Twitter if you want to hear anything good about Twitter. Um, but um, um, but, you know, sort of, I, I think it's interesting, it is interesting to note that just a decade ago, again, the, the internet sort of shut down in protest of um, some pieces of legislation, and it stopped those laws from happening. So the story is, and the documentary sort of gets into this, but SOPA was on its way to being passed. I mean, it was just on the door. This is one of the most politically active I've ever been. I was calling my senator uh, regularly to complain about it. Um, and even a senator I quite like, but he was on the wrong side of this one. Um, but uh, um, uh, but like I said, the, the, the people on the internet sort of got together and said like, no, this is going to ruin the internet as we know it uh, and, um, and, and, and put a stop to it. And that's sort of, it's sort of amazing to me to think 
that that happened now because uh, he's absolutely right that you know th there was an article just yesterday in the in the um, Wall Street Journal about sort of the negative influence of Facebook uh, and its dangerous connections within the government uh, and that, that is not what we thought of Facebook when it started right and when it started it was just a way for you to connect with people and chat and it's still at its core is that it's just that it has again sort of tech on uh, as we see is sort of a double-edged double sword and um I don't really know even where I'm going with this anymore, uh, except to say that um, uh, it's really interesting to sort of reflect on it. I appreciate those comments. I think both of those make great points. Uh, Jean, would you like to comment on this before we get the film going? Just real quick. Um, so I haven't seen the movie. This will be my first time with, with you guys. So, um, but I did, of course, Google when I said I was gonna come watch um, and, where I just think it's interesting is we are in a time right now where we're really looking at defining what does a starting point mean and how do people have different starting points um, in terms of, you know, we're, we're not just a work hard and you'll succeed country. That's not real. Um, and so everyone doesn't start at the same spot. And if we want to give people opportunities, then part of that starts with equal access to the information. Um, and then just the fact that there's the involvement of the criminal justice system in this. And from my time as a prosecutor, spending some time really thinking about what is it that we're protecting? Why is that what we're valuing? And I spend a lot of time thinking about this now, but do we need to reorder what we say our values are in light of what we have seen and where we are now. I think that's an, that's an excellent uh, segue into watching the film. Um, for those who might have joined since I last posted it in chat, I am again going to link you to the Internet Archives um, streaming of this film, which is where we will be streaming this from tonight. Um, we're going to try to share it with you in Zoom in real time. Even if that has hiccups and you're watching it on your own on a different monitor or you decide to watch this later on your own, um, we hope that you can continue this conversation with us. Feel free to stick around through the duration of the film and to chat with the panelists in uh, live in Zoom in the chat and we'll keep this room open until the film ends this evening. Uh, thanks again everyone for joining us and um, we're going to get started. <laughs>